For several months, God has placed a very important message on my heart to bring you this morning. It could be the most important message I'll ever deliver here, and it could be the most important message you will ever hear. A very serious message that is summed up in just five words taken from the Bible. Prepare to meet thy God. Several weeks ago I told you that when I was a boy in the South we would take trips on back roads around Louisiana, Mississippi, and elsewhere. And we'd see these signs that a Kentucky preacher put up there. And I still remember them, such as, Get right with God, or God loves you. But when I saw a certain message that said, Prepare to meet thy God, it caught my attention. It made me afraid. I pray that this morning's message would be a blinking sign and bright red lights haunting you. Prepare to meet thy God. I think I know everyone in this auditorium, but I don't know all of your hearts. I believe that many of you are, in fact, Christians prepared to meet God. Others may only be pretending. And then some of you are definitely not ready to meet God. I ask that everyone here would examine your hearts to make sure that you are ready to meet your Maker one day. These words are found in Amos 4.12. And God reminded the people of Israel that he had chosen them and that he had delivered them from Egypt. And yet they kept wanting to go back to their sins and back to their idolatry. So God sent them Moses, prophets, judges, to remind them of blessings, but also to plead with them and warn them and say, come back to God. He sent them Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos. And through Amos, God rebuked Israel for many sins, pride, ingratitude, their luxurious lifestyle in which they ignored the needs of the poor and social injustice and religious hypocrisy. And then in Amos, God reminded them that he sent disasters to warn them so that they would return to God. But Israel ignored the warnings, all of them. And then, in Amos 4.12, God issued this warning to them. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. This warning applies to all men and women everywhere. God has blessed you abundantly with family, friends, health, food. And you've ignored God and you've clung to your own selfish sins. And then God has also sent you hard times to draw you back to himself. And that hasn't worked either. What will God have to do to get your attention so that you will finally turn back to him? So God gives you and me and all of us this warning as to Israel. Prepare to meet thy God. We prepare for other important events in our lives. We prepare for a wedding. We prepare for retirement. We even prepare for our vacations. But what about the most important event of all? Our death. And when we meet God after death. Richard Baxter, the Puritan, said, I preach as a dying man to dying men. Because all of us here will one day die. A hundred years from now, we'll all be dead. Once I was sitting in the waiting room waiting to see my doctor and 
I heard a terrifying scream in his office. A woman had lost all control. She was shrieking, and then she went hysterical and was pounding on the walls. But the only word I could understand was, no, no, no. And after some time, the nurse and one of her relatives led her out. She could barely walk. She was so distraught. And then the nurse said, it's your turn, Mr. Daniel. And I went in there. And I knew the doctor was a Christian, and I said, did you have to say to her? He said, yes. I told her she has terminal cancer and will have to die in a few months. I prayed for that lady, and my mind went back to Christmas Eve, 1979, when a doctor sat me down and said, young man, you have cancer, and it's bad. We've got to do surgery real soon. And praise God, the surgery was successful. But have you ever wondered what you would do and how you would react if a doctor told you that serious news? I'm sorry, you have cancer or leukemia or some other affliction that's very serious. God sent Isaiah to King Hezekiah, and he said, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Dear brethren, I come to you as your preacher and as your friend and as, in a way, the doctor of your souls with this message for you this morning. Prepare to meet your God. Let's all open now in our Bibles to Luke chapter 12, where we read about a man that was not prepared to meet God. Jesus told this parable, starting in verse 16. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The man in the story prepared for retirement, but he didn't prepare for death. He prepared for old age, but he didn't prepare for eternity. We're told here that he thought he had many years. He didn't even have one more day, and he didn't know it. Like him, there are many people that make earthly preparations for the future, and that's good. But they make no heavenly preparations to meet God, and that's bad. In this story, the man was a rich farmer. Notice, he's not a thief. He's not a swindler. He's not a drug dealer. He's he's not a terrorist. He has an honest job. He supplied food and people need food. But he forgot one thing. Jesus said man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He became very rich, and so he made plans to get richer still. And that's the goal of so many people today. Save it up and then spend it. And like this man, they think, save it up and then you can have fun. You've got it made. Eat, drink, and be merry. Have fun. And if that's all there is to life, they're right. But according to God's word, they're wrong. That's not all there is. In Hebrews 9, 27, God says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. 
This man couldn't take that money with him, and neither can anybody else. You can't take your possessions, your bank account, you can't even take your clothes. It won't do you any good in the next life. Archaeologists have found rooms in the pyramids where they buried the pharaohs and they stored up gold and emeralds. And in one of them, they even found a boat and they'd put different tools and things that the man would need in the next life. But all that gold in the boat is still in the pyramid with the mummies of those pharaohs. But their souls left. They couldn't bring any of that with them and neither could this man And neither can we. The man thought he was wise and clever. But notice God came to him and said, you fool. You're very unwise. Some people are like that. Even when they're facing death, their foolishness comes out. I remembered that when I was having treatment for that cancer and I was in the hospital, it was one of those old-fashioned wards where about 20 men were in the same room and you could overhear their conversations with the doctors. And I remember one day a doctor came in to talk to one of the patients who had been coughing and wheezing all the time. He said, you have cancer of the lungs, but I think we can catch it in time. If we have surgery and they put you through radiation, I think we can catch it. But there's one Stipulation, you have to stop smoking. You've been sneaking out there and smoking several packs a day. You have to stop smoking or we can't treat you. You have to stop to save your life. The man said to the doctor, I won't. Notice he didn't say I can't. He said, I won't. I won't give up smoking. The doctor said, please, to save your life. The man said, I won't. And I saw the doctor do something that I've never seen a doctor do. He got mad with the patient. He said, then you go home and die. I won't have fools die in my hospital. Nurse, this man's checking out. And the doctor walked away and the man had to check out. And he went home and died because he wouldn't give up smoking. He'd say, what a fool. But are you not the same if you won't give up your sins? God says, unless you repent, you will perish. And you're no different than that man in the hospital or the man in this story. The man in the story thought he was rich, but he was poor before God. He thought he would live for many more years. But the text said he died that very night. And he went to meet God. You could die tonight. You could die tomorrow or next week. And that's why God's word comes to you and says, prepare to meet thy God. The man prepared for retirement, but he did not prepare to meet God. I've read the last words of men and women on their deathbeds, and I read the words of Cesare Borgia, who about five or six hundred years ago was one of the wealthiest men of all Europe, more powerful than the Pope and the kings. And these are his words on his deathbed. I have provided in the course of my life for everything except death. And now, alas, I am to die totally unprepared. Will that be you one day? God sends us warnings as he did to the man in the story and to the Jews in the book of Amos. And the warning is, prepare to meet thy God. One day God will send you your last warning. Last Sunday night we briefly looked at the story of the King Belshazzar. and God sent handwriting on the wall and Daniel came and interpreted it and said, You've been weighed in the balances and found warning. And basically he said to the king, this is your last warning. The king didn't take it. And we're told that that very night, enemy soldiers broke through and killed him in his sleep, in his very bed. He didn't heed his last warning. Seven or eight years ago, I preached a series in this church on heaven and hell. Some of you remember that. And I remember when we went through talking about hell, it was very serious. And there was a man sitting about right there, and he'd been coming to this church for about 30 years. 
And I remember I met with him in his home many times and we talked about God and salvation. And he still didn't understand how to get ready to meet God. He still wasn't saved after all those years. And then I remember when I was preaching on hell one Sunday in particular, I said, we need to be ready. And I pled with the church. And I remember saying, this may be your last warning. In the middle of the week, I was preaching down in St. Louis and I had a phone call and they said, We need you to come back immediately. Do you know such and such? I said, yes. They said he woke up that morning. He wasn't feeling too well, so his wife took him to the doctor and to the hospital. He said, I just don't feel too well. And he laid down in the hospital, and he died suddenly. And the next Sunday, one of the men in the church came to me and said, do you remember what you said? I said, I remember what I said last Sunday. It may be your last warning. And it was that man's last warning. He didn't believe it. He didn't heed it. And he died unprepared. Prepare to meet thy God. I heard a well-known preacher and writer named R.J. Rushdoody tell a story. When he was a young man, he started his ministry back in the 1940s as a missionary to the Shoshone Indians out west. And he said for miles and counties around, there were hardly any churches or preachers, so they would call on him for various things, the police and doctors and various people. One night, Dr. Fondeman said, Reverend Rushdoony, come quickly. There's a woman in the hospital. Would you come and... Do whatever you preachers or priests do. She, she's going to die and she's in a coma. Would you, would you come? So he said, of course. So he came and she was in a coma. And he sat there all alone with her and he, he didn't know if she could understand him. But he remembered reading somewhere that sometimes a person in a coma can understand you but just can't respond. So he said, lady, I, I've never met you, but the doctors say you're, you're hanging on by a thread. You could die at any time, so let me tell you how to get ready to meet God. So he told her about Christ and the cross, and he he begged her, and he read Scripture, and he prayed with her. And she didn't even blink. She was in a coma. So he left, and the doctor said, well, thank you so much for doing this favor. The next morning, the doctor phoned him and said, Reverend Rushdoony, Get over here immediately. She came out of the coma and she's asking for you by name. He jumped in the car and drove over there as fast as he could and came in with his Bible. And she was wide awake and she said, say a few words. And he did. She said, yep, that's the voice. I heard everything you said last night. I just couldn't respond. And he said, doctor says you're still hanging on by a thread. I think God's given you one more chance. Please believe in Jesus. And she thought about it and said, no, I'm not interested. But thank you anyway for coming and and visiting with me. And he said, please, this could be your last chance. And she said, I'm not interested. I'm not religious. So he left and went home. Next day, the doctor phoned and said, Reverend Rushdoony, would you come back? She died in her sleep. Would you do the funeral? It was her last warning and God woke up and gave her one more chance and she didn't take it. You'd say, what a fool. Yes. And we're all fools. You see, we're hanging over a cliff by a tiny branch that could break at any time. And we're fools if we don't take the hand of God that's reaching down and says, take my hand. That branch could go at any moment. We're fools if we don't reach out. The Bible tells us all of us will one day die. Psalm 89, 48 says, What man can live and not see death? You've known people who've died. Many of you, it was a close relative, your parent, a friend, a wife. Have you ever known anyone that never died? No, of course not. And one day, it will be your turn to die. And it can happen at any stage in life. Even in childhood, children. When I was 10 years old, my 12-year-old cousin died of leukemia. And as your friend, children, I tell you, 
children younger than you have died. If you can understand this message this morning, you're old enough to get ready to die and meet God. I ask you to go home and talk with your parents about this most important subject. And then there are those that are much older. The elderly are much closer to meeting God than ever before. We have two nursing home ministries every week. And every couple of months, one of those dear souls dies. Sometimes they've been coming for years hearing the messages. We all need to prepare to meet God. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. We could die at any moment. 1 Samuel 23 says, There is but a step between me and death. Even unexpected little things, little tiny things. You could choke on a piece of food. People have died like that. A heart attack. You know what sometimes causes that? A little tiny microscopic piece of flesh on the inside of one of the veins or arteries, smaller than the head of a pen, may break off and clog up that artery and heart attack. And a person can die suddenly. Two of my childhood friends had moved to San Francisco when they grew up. And one of them told me that... uh, He was driving with the other. It was Tommy driving with Jay. And they were driving out by the Golden Gate Bridge. And Jay said to Tommy, he says, I've got a terrible headache. Pull over. Tommy pulled over. And Jay just slumped over into Tommy's arms. And Tommy later told me, Kurt, he was dead. Seconds after he said, I've got a bad headache. It was a brain aneurysm. Some little blood vessel up there clogged or broke little blood vessel smaller than a thread. And he was gone just like that. No warning. We could die in a car accident. And just as none of us know the day or the hour of the second coming of Christ, none of us knows the day or the hour of our death. But we do know that Christ will come one day and we will one day die if we don't live to see the second coming. And if you are a lost sinner, when Christ comes, that will be the day that you will die. Anyone, anytime, anywhere can die. You could die in your sleep. Gas leaks. You have a hot water heater. You have a gas heater. One little leak. You could die in your sleep. You could die unexpectedly, even while having fun. Remember when I lived overseas studying, some friends and I would go out to a park and would share the gospel. I remember one day... There was a man, I guess he was in his 40s, maybe about 50. He was one of those guys that was kind of slender but wiry and solid muscle. And he would always come out there with his 10-speed bicycle and listen and heckle us and laugh and curse and tell dirty things. And would say, get ready to meet God. And he'd say, ah, and he'd curse and he'd get on his bike and ride off. Come back the next Sunday, do the same thing. One Sunday, completely different. He came there standing next to his bicycle, listening and with his eyes wide open, and afterwards I came and talked to him. I said, what's happened? He said, man, the other day I was riding this bicycle, and a car hit me and knocked me about 20 or 30 feet, and I thought it was going to run over me. I scared to death that I was going to die. And he comes up to me and he said, tell me once more about God and how I can get ready to meet him. That could happen to you in your car, on a bicycle, or just taking a walk. Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto man once to die. And that's an appointment all of us will keep, but we don't know when it will be. Ecclesiastes 8 and 9 says this, he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him when it will occur? No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit, and no one has power in the day of death. For man does not know his time, it falls suddenly upon him. When I was again studying in London, I went and visited a good friend of mine that was a preacher. And I had to wait for him in his study. And late at night he came in while I was sitting there waiting. I said, David, what kept you? And David had a funny look on his face. I said, Davy, you you look like you've seen death itself. He says, I have. I said, sit down and tell me about it. And he was shaking. 
He says, there's been a man coming to our church for some time and I've been visiting him and he's very sick and I just came from his house and I just felt compelled to tell him, get ready to meet God, you're sick. The man would say, oh, don't worry about that. He says, the man kind of sat up in the bed and said, oh, don't worry about that. There's plenty of time. And the words no sooner left his mouth than he clutched his heart, yelled out, yell, let out a yell, and fell back in the pillow. Yeah! And his last words were, there's plenty of time. We never know. Sometimes it happens when we think everything is safe and we're having fun. We can handle it. Recently, I saw a documentary that talked about how pilots sometimes ignore the instruments and they try to fly by the seat of their pants and they go into a cloud and they get disoriented. They think they're going up when they're going down. And so they played back the recording of a plane. They first showed the plane. It was a little Piper Cub that had crashed into the side of the mountain. And they got the, the black box and it recorded both the air traffic controllers and the pilot himself. And the pilot said, I'm confused. I'm lost in the cloud. And the controller said, stick with your instruments. Put it on automatic pilot. And the man said, I'm confused. I, I, I'm lost. I, I, I don't, I don't, where, where am I going? And they said, let go of the controls. You, you, you're going down. You, you stick to the, your controls. And the man, in the last words, were, were, the man said, help, 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 help. And the recording went silent. Because the plane had crashed. And his last words were, help, help, help. It was terrifying to listen to it. He had no more time left. A Jewish man asked his rabbi, Rabbi, when should a man be prepared to meet his maker? And the rabbi said, a man should be ready to meet his maker one day before he dies. And the man said, But Rabbi, we don't know when that will be. So the rabbi said, then do it today. And that's good advice. Even when we sense it's coming, we might be sick or we almost have intuitions it's coming soon. People begin to make excuses and delays. Some of you know that I wrote to an inmate a few years ago. It was on death row. I think it was in Indiana. Now, some of the inmates that write to me have been converted in prison. Other ones, I think they're just trying to look good for parole or pardon or something like this. And that was the case with this guy. He always claimed to be real religious and he'd read the books and ask questions. But he was on death row and he, he, he was saying, I have a, a, a date set for my execution. Ah, but I think I'll, I'll get a stay. And, you know, I think I might even get clemency or a pardon. Well, I checked it out on the Internet and he had killed a policeman. No governor is going to give him a pardon. So he had a brief stay of execution, and that gave him a little hope. He said, I think this is it. And I said, buddy, they just delayed your time. You better get ready to meet God. So he'd write back, no, no, I think, I said. So finally I wrote him a very serious letter. I said, buddy, you're going to die in just a few days. They're going to take you into a room and lock it, and they're going to strap you with big leather straps around your hands and around your neck so you can't get out. And I don't know if they're going to give you an injection, or they're going to get poison gas that you breathe, or this is going to electrocute you. But I said, mister, you're going to die. Prepare to meet your God. And he sent back a letter that was just kind of filled with nonsense. I sent him another one, and that letter was returned to sender. He was executed. And he kept making up excuses and delays. Denial. And he died unprepared. Will you die unprepared? Prepare to meet thy God. Now, some people hear this sort of message and they laugh. They say, oh, so what? Yeah, I'll die one day. So what's the big deal? You die, that's all. There's nothing after that. Nothing to worry about. Or I've even heard some men that are kind of macho. You know the kind. They brag and they say, ah, so what? When death comes, I'll spit in its face. Okay, Mr. Macho Man. Let me address that you with something like with something unusual that Jesus Christ said. Maybe you're not prepared to meet God. Maybe you say, oh, don't worry about that. Jesus said two interesting things. First, in Matthew 5, he said, 
agree with your adversary before you appear before the judge who will condemn you and turn you over to the officer and then send you to prison. Matthew 18, he talked about a wicked servant and the master had him arrested and condemned. And it says his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. What's this, what's this all about? In the ancient customs then, this is what happened. It, a person could be arrested and condemned and then the officer would take him to prison to serve his term. And he'd never get out. But in some of those prisons, they were not just your regular guards. They were the lictors. These were those big, strong men that came in with whips and hot irons and would torture the prisoners. It could be once a day, once a week, whenever. Wake them up in the middle of the night. Years ago, I met a preacher who had been arrested by the communists for preaching the gospel. And for 14 years, he was in a communist prison in Romania. And he was tortured regularly for his faith. And he wrote a little book called Tortured for His Faith. But in Jesus' story, there will be people that will go to the prison of hell, not tortured for their faith, but tortured for their unbelief. Ever wonder who are these torturers in the stories that Jesus is talking about? Satan and the demons. Like a group of evil sadists just waiting to torture their victims. I read Jonathan Edwards on this. He alluded to 1 Peter 5, 8, where it says, Your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Psalm 17, 12 says, As a lion is eager to tear his prey, and like a young lion lurking in secret places. Have you ever seen one of those TV documentaries where there's a, a lion lurking behind a bush and he sees a deer grazing at the last minute? He pounces on it and he takes it down and he rips its throat out. And then he drinks its blood and eats its meat and then chews on the bones. The Bible says that's the picture of the devil waiting to pounce upon lost sinners. You see, according to the Bible, Satan knows he's going to hell. He knows there's no hope for him. But like a hungry lion, he wants to take people to hell with him where he can torture them. And he wants to take you there if you are a lost sinner. What's keeping him? God and God alone. He's on God's chain. And the only thing, listen to me, the only thing that is restraining Satan from sinking his teeth into you and taking you to hell is God Almighty. God's got him on the chain. And Satan wants to take you. And the only thing that's stopping him is the sheer good pleasure of God. Because God knows it's not your appointed time yet. And then that time will come when God will, as it were, click off the days and then the seconds. Ten, nine, eight. And then he'll look at Satan and say, you want him? Take him. He's yours. And immediately Satan will fall upon his prey. And there'll be no hope. Maybe you're a Mr. Macho Man. And you say, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in preparing to meet God. Then prepare to meet the devil. You're no match for him. And he's got an army of demons waiting to take you and torture you. If you're still in your sins, you need to prepare for your eternal destiny that awaits you after death. Hell. What do you have to do to prepare to go to hell? Nothing. Your sins have already prepared you for hell. You don't have to do anything else to go to hell. You're already on your way there. Now let me surprise you with this explanation and warning. Some people ignore this sort of preaching. But others will listen closely and maybe get afraid and even have nightmares. They don't want to go to hell. They know they're going. They deserve it and they know it. So they begin to pray. They go to church. They even beg God and they'll say, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Help, help. I don't want to die. I don't want to be tortured. I don't want to go to the fires of hell. And it sounds good. But something crucial is missing. 
repentance. It's not that they want to forsake their sins. It's not that they want to go to heaven and be with God. They just don't want to go to hell. They're no different than those demons in Matthew 8. Remember, Jesus came to this man that was demon-possessed with many demons. What did they cry out to Jesus? They said, if you come to torment us before the time, they knew that their destiny was to go to hell, and they didn't want to go to hell, so they begged Jesus, don't cast us out. If you cast us out, at least send us into those pigs. They'd rather be living in pigs than go to hell. They didn't want to go to heaven. They didn't want to repent. They just didn't want to go to hell. There are people today, they're afraid to go to hell. And they'll get on their knees and beg and cry and go to church and say rosaries and all this. They're no different than those demons if they don't repent. And so for them, they may be afraid. But they're only in a selfish way not wanting to go to hell. They're no different than those demons. You see, dear friends... You have to have a lot more than the fear of death or the fear of hell or even the fear of the devil. You have to have faith and repentance. You see, you have to deal with your sins. And that means repentance. You need not only to prepare to meet death and Satan and hell. In the words of our text, you must prepare to meet thy sins. God. After death, you will face God face to face, personally. No excuses will be accepted. And if you die in your sins, you will face the wrath of God Almighty forever. And that's worse than any of your nightmares or even worse than the evil sadism of Satan and the demons. Hosea 13.8. And this is God speaking, giving them a warning like Hosea. And he says this, quote, I will meet them like a bear deprived of her cubs. I will tear open their rib cage, and there I will devour them like a lion. And you will be helpless to withstand, withstand the wrath of God Almighty. God warns you. But since He warns you, that's telling you there's still time to repent and turn back. There's still time for mercy. The doors of mercy are still wide open. God loves you enough to warn you there's still time for salvation. Someone might say, why should I prepare? Why not just live it up and put it off? You'll be like the man in the story that was a fool. It's the better part of wisdom to prepare for your own death. And not just getting a will ready and your burial plot. Get ready for your eternal destiny. So wisdom demands it. And then some people have the mistaken notion, well... Okay, here, here's the deal. They say, after I die, God's got to give us a second chance. And that's when I'll accept it. I'll put it off and, you know, he'll give it a little grace period after I die. Recently, I was watching a, an old interview of David Frost, the BBC English interviewer, interviewing Billy Graham. And he says, Mr. Graham, if what you've said is true about God loving everybody and I'm offering them salvation, then God has to let everybody into heaven. He has to give them that second chance, doesn't he? I remember Billy Graham got real quiet and said, well, God doesn't have to do anything. Years later, David Foss said he had never thought of it like that. That's right, God doesn't have to give a second chance. And he doesn't give a second chance after death. Your chance is on this side of the grave. Prepare to meet thy God now. Don't put it off. Don't delay. And as I've said to several prisoners, including the one who was executed, don't gamble with your eternal destiny when you're hanging by a thin rope over the fires of hell. And the rope is on fire. How do you prepare to meet God? Maybe you said, you've got my attention. How do I prepare to meet God? Some of you may not know. Some of you do know because you've heard it from me or your parents or reading it in the Bible yourself. Please listen one more time very closely. Maybe you have Christian parents, but you too need to repent and believe. Maybe you're not sure. Make sure and don't gamble and don't do 
these little deals and bargains people do with God. Twenty years ago, my favorite uncle was dying, dying of emphysema. Big, tough guy. My mother and I talked to him and tried to tell him the gospel. And I remember he said, I don't want to hear anymore. I go to Mass. And he looked at us and said, I fixed it with the priest. Don't talk to me anymore. And we knew what he meant. He gave a lot of money to that Catholic priest and to the Catholic Church to have Mass and said for him after he died. And somehow that get him out of purgatory. And I remember after my uncle Bubba died, I was thinking he was swindled. He was cheated and he's in hell now because he's clinging to that false hope. Have you been cheated? Maybe someone said, okay, you don't want to go to hell, you want to go to heaven. It's very easy, just come over here, just repeat this little prayer and, and shake my hand and that's it. And some of us know that's a swindle. Because it doesn't require repentance. It doesn't change a person's life. And they're thinking, I've got it. I've got my fire insurance. And they're no different than my uncle that had his masses after he died. If you've been cheated, prepare to meet thy God. How? About the same time as that uncle died, I remember I was hunting in South Texas. And at the end of the day, various hunters around there would gather around a campfire next to a little shack and would tell stories. Hey, did you see that deer? How'd you do today? Now, they knew I was... Uh, preparing to be a preacher, and so they didn't want to talk too much, but they, they liked me because I was a good hunter. And, uh, but there's one guy there, Lonnie, biggest, toughest guy. I mean, he was about six foot six or seven, big, tough guy, kind of like a football player. He didn't even want to look at me. If he did, he'd kind of have that snarl and look in his face like, eh, preachers, Christians, eh. and he'd curse and all that. Then one night, Lonnie showed up, and he came to me and says, Kirk, can we talk? And I said, yeah, sure. So we went to the little cabin. I didn't know if he was going to belt me or curse me out or what. He was nervous. He was shaking and had this look on his face. I said, Lonnie, what's up? And he had big old tears coming down his face. He said, the doctor said, I have cancer. I might die. And he grabbed me and almost lifted me off the ground. And I'll never, ever forget his words. He said, How do you die? I don't know how to die, and I'm scared to death. Kurt, help me. You're a preacher, a priest or something. Help me, help me. How do you die? I will tell you what I told him, how to be ready to die and meet God. Here's how. First, it's God's preparations. God provide atonement. That means... The sacrifice for our sins whereby we can be forgiven by God. God sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to become a sinless man. And 1 Corinthians 15 says Christ died for our sins and rose again. Atonement. Second Chronicles 30 says may the good Lord provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to seek God. That's it. In John 14, Jesus said to his followers, I go to prepare a place for you. He went to the cross and then he went to heaven to prepare the way for us. And then there's our response. We are to prepare our heart to meet God. There's the old saying, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. 1 Samuel 7, 3 says, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and prepare your hearts for the Lord. And Jesus said this, Repent and believe. Repent. Change your mind. Change your heart. Turn from sinners. It says in Samuel, put away the foreign gods. We're not saying live a good life. We're saying in your heart, turn from your sin and turn to God. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. But then he also said, believe. He said, believe in me. Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Trust him from the heart. Unlike a man in Second Chronicles 12, it says he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. And if you prepare your heart and say, I will repent, I will believe. The very moment you truly repent 
and truly believe, you shall be saved, forgiven all of your sins. You will be prepared to meet God in the twinkling of an eye. That's how you prepare to meet your God. And then what about the future? Well, that depends upon whether you are prepared to meet your God or not. For those that are not prepared to meet God, here, let me read you two or three verses by way of warning. And notice the word prepare. And this is, these are the words of God himself. Jeremiah 12, 3. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of the slaughter. That's talking about judgment. Ezekiel 35, 3. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood and blood shall pursue you. And then on judgment day, what does God say? When God is on the throne and if you die in your sins, you will appear before him. What is God's judgment on lost sinners? Just this. He will look at you and say, depart from me, you cursed ones, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. God will say that to you if you die unprepared, lost in your sins. Earlier this year, I did a funeral for a young man, only 26. I didn't know him too well. But the family wanted some of his favorite rock and roll songs played before and after the funeral. And as I was walking up to the platform with my Bible to lead the funeral, they were playing a song. I don't even know who sang it. It was kind of one of those angry, growling songs, heavy metal. And the very words were, I'm on the highway to hell. And I remember thinking, boy, is he right. Are you on the highway to hell or on the highway to heaven? And for those of us that are prepared to meet God, when we come to die, it'll be the happiest day of our life because we're ready. We've got our reservation. And then at the judgment day, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself will look at you and smile and say, come, you blessed ones, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. One day, everyone in this room will die, either as a Christian or as a lost sinner. Jesus said, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. How will you die? At the church I served back in Texas, there is a dear friend of mine, Dr. Radford, top radiologist. I remember he said, Kurt, no doctor likes to lose a patient, but we've lost patients. Many of them. He said, let me tell you how I became a Christian a few years ago. He had been at the bedside of innumerable patients that had died, some in pain, some in their sleep. And he began to notice a big difference. There were those that died in hope, even in joy. And he noticed they were Christians and they often tried to talk to him. And he says, and then there are the others. And he says, one by one by one. He says, I can tell you dozens of stories. They died not only in agony, but in fear. No hope. And he says, Kurt, I couldn't get away from that. I, start, I got a Bible, started reading. I started going to a church and they told me about Christ. He said, I don't want to die like that. I want to die like that. He says, that got me to seeking Christ. And he says, at the right time, I did become a Christian. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said, Laugh at us all you want to, but our people die well. Now let me say something very serious to everyone here. I'm your pastor. I will probably perform your funeral. You've been to funerals. The time will come, I'll say a few words. Loved ones will be there, your family, your friends. They'll be weeping. Men will be comforting the women and will go to the graveside. And I'll say a few last words and we'll have a prayer. And your body will be in the coffin. And your friends, your family will walk away weeping. Your soul won't be there. Your soul will either be in heaven or in hell. I don't want to do another funeral for a lost sinner. But I will 
to comfort the grieving, and to give hope to those that are still living. And I tell you, after you've heard these words, you will have to walk over the tears of this preacher to go to hell. Because I love you enough to warn you and to pray for you. In God's name, I beg you, prepare to meet thy God. I beg you in love. And God warns you, prepare to meet thy God. Shall we pray? Our Father, you have warned us. I pray, Father, that you would send your spirit to touch every heart and within the sound of my voice. Holy Spirit, you can convict a person of sin. What's more, you can convert a person from sin. We plead with you that you would do the miracle in their life that they cannot do for themselves. You can prepare them to meet God. Give them faith. Give them repentance. Bring them screaming and crying, if necessary, to the cross. Save them, O Lord. We pray for our friends and even our relatives that are lost. Hear our prayers on their behalf. And Father, we that are saved by your grace, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you saved us and you prepared us to meet you. For you are our God and our Savior. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.